ఒక ఆధ్యాత్మికవేత్త స్పిరిచువల్ మాస్టర్ ధాజీ అమెరికా పర్యటనలో భాగంగా టీవీ నైన్ యుఎస్ఏ తో అమెరికాలో కార్యక్రమాల గురించి చెప్పిన విషయాలు ఇప్పుడు చూద్దాం Well, I didn't like to be called Guruji and Maharaj and things like that. So I picked up a name so that would go well with people as well as accept it in the society. And it's more affectionate when you call someone, because in India by and large and in Iran also, it's uncle. Right. In Iran, <coughs> mother's brother. in india it's father's brother who is considered as daji mm-hmm. so i thought why not i become everybody's uncle so so it's it's the name given by the people yes great so almost like uh, we are seeing you in us after 7 years so you know why did you take this long gap my health it would not permit also so much of work was happening at kanha mm-hmm. in hyderabad so that kept us going and of course in between two years of covid <laughs> right so how was your us tour going so far so far it has been excellent it has been really productive mm-hmm. and i met a lot of new faces uh, so it's it shows uh, growth and interest in coming generations you know people are more interested in spirituality which is very hopeful and very inspiring and that keeps you going so so you spoke about the coming generations so the youth today they have like you know they listen to a lot of things from right left center so you know they have a lot of questions whether to believe in god you know few people you know they are becoming atheists and like you know few people are getting into spirituality but according to you what is the right definition of god is it lord rama krishna so according to you what is god god to me is a principle not a person when someone says i am an atheist i resonate well with atheists because a one fundamental thing they are honest their honesty is reflected in their claim but it is too fast too bold and too quick B- not believing is also a belief but they are very honest because you have not seen you have not felt you have not perceived so on what grounds would you believe science is all about and so should all religion be both must stand on the foundation of experiments and conclusion but unless and until i see i can't believe so when i see the sun and the trees and the sky do i have to believe no i see them so the belief to me is a mask we wear and we go on with it i used to tease my mother okay ma please tell me do you believe in god and she was very enthusiastically says yes 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 i believe but when you ask next question why do you believe in god she slows down with her spirit and she so oh, my mother taught me my father taught me my grandfather our religion our shastras our holy book scriptures but what about you she i have not experience and same thing my father used to say cuz i used to see him waking up at 4 in the morning and in the evening also twice a day he would do aarti visit temples feed some birds also on the way he said i asked him you've been doing this for last 62 years have you experienced anything he said no i'm waiting for something so to me <coughs> knowledge the belief dogmas inculcated into us by our religion they are good it's a good training but without the backing of experiences 
this knowledge, beliefs and dogmas, they remain hollow and unproductive. And we remain merely superficially satisfied with this, having believed. I'm also believing. But when there is no foundation in our belief, a little bit goes, goes awkward, for example. Your spouse misbehaves with you or your children fall sick or your business fails. Then you begin questioning God's existence. So that's how deep our faith is. But when you experience, then these doubts will not come. So I sympathize with today's youth because they are not going to buy the belief just like that without experiencing. So my next question is, how do they experience? Well, the first of all, the direction should be the correct direction to reach a proper destination. All religions, they talk about presence of the divinity in the heart. And when all these religions describe the nature of God, on one thing they are very <coughs> in good agreement, only in one thing, perhaps few other things. But one thing that stands out in all religion, that God is love. And where can you feel the presence of love? Not in your liver, <laughs> not in your kidneys or lungs, <coughs> only in the heart. So it is for this reason that one has to go within, right? And does your God, does your life force, let's see, the entity that gives you life, is, is it outside yourself? Like we saw little Hugo just now, <coughs> right? Imagine the pain mother goes through at the moment of delivery. It's, it's like a hell let loose. And as soon as baby arrives, baby begins to cry. It's a sign that life force has come along. If this baby did not cry, then doctors would go crazy. Nurses would be on a high alert. Then they would tilt the baby upside down and tap to stimulate the heart and the lungs. And if the baby is still... <laughs> doesn't cry, then mommy has to cry, the whole family cries. Because that life force did not come, did not come along. See? So that life force is within me, that godly entity that is within me, is not outside me. And when one starts looking for that presence outside, I take it as the wrong direction. Tell me one thing. Was not Lord Jesus a divine personality? Yes. He was. Was not Lord Krishna a divine personality? Yes. He was. Lord Rama, whom you question as God, right? Now, <clears throat> did anyone recognize their divinity in their lifetime? Their parents, their dearest friends? No one. In fact, the recent, the latest Lord Jesus was actually hanged. They hang the Son of God. How could you do that? Ignorance. Ignorance arising out because you did not recognize the divinity in Him. In India, we recognize divinity in everything be it a cow or a dog or a donkey or a horse or a tree or a river or a mountain. Even non-living entities are considered as God's representative. But there too they could not see the thriving, living and thriving entity of divinity in Krishna. He had so many enemies in his lifetime. Lord Rama, similar story. No one could understand his divinity. If only his mother had recognized K.K., his divinity, then all the problems could have been solved. But see, too, mother, too, could not recognize the divinity. So having those real divine personification, embodied, incarnated beings who were here walking on this, walking on this planet, no one could recognize. So how are you ever going to recognize them after 10,000 years, 7,000 years, 2,000 years? 
when their contemporaries could not, how are we going to recognize them as divine personification through symbols, through statues, through photographs? So the direction is wrong. The divinity is within, and where are we looking? You're looking in a temple. So I mean, then uh, you mean that like the rituals, what we do, like the pujas, and you know, that's how like you know people these days reach God. So are they not right? What did I just say? Your direction is in a wrong, wrong way. It is Veda. Hinduism is based on Vedas and Upanishads and Gita. Lord Krishna says, Hridaya me pasyasi. Look myself in your heart. Has anyone understood that? One of the slokas, he says, I dwell in every living being. Vedas and Upanishads defines that life force, Atman, as Antaryamin. They have not described that as Bahiryamin, one who lives outside. And where will you find this externally existing divinity in this vast universe? Where will you go? On planet Mars? Where will you find them? So, this entity is also not localized entity. So, we say omnipresent is everywhere. Now, I have the direct perception of myself. So, why not look within myself? Simple. You've been to Tirupati. Have you done the darshan? How many hours you waited in the line? About. And when you were at the sanctum centurium, how much minutes did you spend? What did you feel? You feel good like looking at the, you know, you, you absorb that vibration and you mm. feel good. And that's all. And then you, you take it back and then you feel that presence. I'll tell you. Feeling is good. Yeah. You feel that I have done something noble. I have fulfilled my duty. So, here onward, now onward, I'll be better than I was before the darshan. So, with this fallacy, we go on. You know, Congress contestants, BRS politicians, BJP politicians, independent politicians, they all go to Tirupati. Who wins? They all seek blessings of the Lord. If one darshan solves all the problems, then everybody's problems would have been solved equally. It does not happen that way, see. I tell you one more thing. There's a big difference between loving, as a verb, and being love, as a noun. For example, when you are in the company of a very wealthy friend, on a private island, you spend six months together. You enjoy every little thing there, not a moment of regret. But only one regret in your heart will remain, I wish I was also as rich. You have experienced the rich hospitality, but still there is this thing, I wish I was as rich. It means becoming is in your vision now, I want to become as rich. So, divine experiences, however satisfactory they be, either in front of a statue or in deep meditation, they are great experiences, no doubt. But we have to go beyond experiences and become divine ourselves. You see, it's not enough to be a worshipper of the Lord. The next step of becoming has to come. Otherwise, that same selfishness, same prejudiced mind, same hatred, same anger, you go to Tirupati, worship, and the next thing you do is beat up your wife and shout at her and be angry with her. Is that darshan? Darshan should have transformed human beings. But we go there, oh, I have done enough damage. Let me go worship and wash off my sins, as if God is there to wash off all your sins. No, it doesn't work like that. 
is not a dispenser of gifts in your life, neither a punisher. We punish ourselves and we reward ourselves through our own karma. And that's what Gita is all about, karma. Your own deeds, you pay for them, all of them. How is God going to say, I wash you, wash off this karma from you, I wash off that karma from you? Then how would the murderer of your mother's mother or rapist, they can also go to Tirupati and say, please forgive me for this and you do it again. Same thing happens in Christianity every Friday, please God forgive me for all the sins. It doesn't work like that. So, and recently we had this International Yoga Day and right now in the world, every country, and they are celebrating this yoga and mm. the awareness, if you can see, Times Square was filled with everybody doing yoga. Do you feel that yoga is really important in transforming our lives? Not the way yoga is understood in the West. You know, when you go to a high class restaurant, when they have a menu or they have buffet, in the hundreds of dishes in buffet, you pick and choose. That's what people are doing. They're picking and choosing asanas, physical exercise. Some they choose breathing exercise. That's all. And these are only two elements out of eight elements. Mm -hmm. They have ignored the rest of the six. The very first one that says Yama, the second one is Niyama. They are crucial to a spiritual existence. But you cannot arrive at them without meditation. Because to understand what is Yama and what is Niyama, you have to have a meditative mind. So meditation first. Why in the world sage like Patanjali give the very first step a name Yama? You know the Yama means Lord of Death. Why would he start the first step itself with Lord of Death? He is trying to convey to kill, to kill all our negative tendencies, violent tendencies, obsessive tendencies, all sorts of negative tendencies, you curb them, kill them. Ni Yama is opposite, to embrace all the good qualities. So these first two steps are very crucial. But without having a meditative mind, you cannot discern between right and wrong, what to do next and what not to do next. You get sensitized only through meditation. Now, not just ordinary meditation, but contemplative heartfulness practices can awaken your consciousness to a very large extent. And also, what is the message you would like to give? the youth right now, because in America there are so many people directionless, there's nobody to guide them. So what would you like to tell them? Well, be the scientist, even in the field of spirituality. Dissect things properly. Don't believe just because your mother says so, or my father says so, believe in God, no. You are a scientist, your heart is your own laboratory. Run those experiments, whether God exists or not, you do the test. And you are the outcome of that experiment. You are the product of that experiment. See, I would say have an agnostic approach. Don't believe that God exists and don't also believe that God does not exist. I don't know whether He exists or not. We start with this neutral approach. To believe and run with it, you will be short-changing yourself. And not to believe, it will be in worse, actually. But to prove it to yourself first and say, it does exist because I experience it. And we are here at Heartfulness. Anyone wants to try and meditate and see oneself every day transforming little by little, little by little. This is a yogic path, which is beyond religions. 
It's neither Hindu, nor Muslim, nor Christian, nor Judah. It is beyond religions. Because we entertain that entity in our heart without any form. We entertain that principle in our heart, see. And that is experienceable. Great. So is there any like website to enroll or anything like, you know, because a lot of people now would want to <laughs> join and, yeah. and uh, because... Uh, we have this Heartfulness Meditation yes. app. Mm -hmm. We also have a website heartfulness.org or, or srcm.org. So. And are there like you know, some regular camps and meditation? For, I mean, I'm, I'm talking yeah. about the American uh, region. Yeah, we have two yeah. group meditations every week. And with this app, you can meditate anytime you want and in any place you want. For example, at 2 o'clock in the morning you wake up and say, Oh, I'm in New York and 2 o'clock I want to meditate with someone, a trainer. But you can't trouble someone at 2 in the morning. So you use this app. It's like Uber cap, okay. right? <laughs> so you punch it in. Oh, I. It is absolutely in your own privacy, right? <laughs> and then someone who is awake, in Japan or China, a trainer would connect with you and say, okay, Ujjwal, I'm sitting in China, you sit wherever you are and we'll meditate together. And that's how it works here. But you can meditate alone also, on your own. And there are three practices, very true heartfulness, morning meditation, evening there's a special meditation, and just five minutes before we retire to bed. Great. So thank you so much, sir, for sharing thank so you, much George. information and then I'm sure this is helpful to everybody, to all the mankind. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Ajwalji. Namaskaram. Namaskaram.